he is the he was the director of the welded structure foundation and also the previously served as the editor in chief of the journal very popular journal welding in the world so you can friends you can understand that uh, he has got a very prolific research you know the expertise in the field of uh, the, the welding and i would like to mention that at this moment time at australia is at you know the professor nodis place is 2 o'clock in the early morning so when you finish the lecture it will be 3 o'clock you can imagine that uh, the professor nodis is so much passionate to you know and 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 so prolific researcher and that's why he has shown interest and we are really very honored and grateful to professor nodis that he has accepted our invitation with this i would like to request professor nodis to uh, you know the uh, deliver his talk Thank you very much. That was a, a very <laughs> flattering um, introduction. Um, I hope I can uh, uh, deliver a, a talk that's as, uh, as interesting as you, you made the introduction sound. Um, I hope that uh, everyone can, can see me now on the yeah. Yeah. Um, what I will do is I'll um, I'll share a, I'll start by sharing my presentation. Um, shortly after sharing the presentation, I'll probably um, stop my video, so you'll get the presentation rather than uh, my uh, my video. Uh, and the, the reason for that is I've got some uh, uh, videos embedded in the the presentation, and I um, I'm attempting to to save some bandwidth uh, by taking my face off the screen, and then I'll come back when the uh, when the um, PowerPoint presentation is uh, has completed. So I'll now attempt to share the the video um, and hopefully you can now see the uh, the the top yeah. slide yeah it is that's good um, yeah so i'll now mute my video uh, and you should hopefully you can still hear me yeah yeah you can we can hear good. you and see your slide as well good um so the the talk i'm uh, giving this morning is uh, or, <laughs> or this evening for you is uh, on recent advances in gas shielded arc welding um really um there are you'll see at the bottom of that slide that um, I'm associated uh, with, prof as Professor Powell said, with the University of Wollongong uh, for the last 26 years. Um, but I'm involved with what's called the Facility for Intelligent Fabrication, which actually is a very similar organization to your own. Um, in particular, we um, we attempt to bridge the gap between academic research and industry requirements, and I think you'll you'll see that as I go through the presentation. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to split the presentation into four areas uh, for clarity. I shall be talking about digital process controlling in gas metal art welding, which is uh, the sort of um, basic area. And then I'll talk about how that's emerged in, uh, in the enhancements with robotic automation uh, wire arc additive manufacturing and uh, and digital data monitoring, which are all areas that you're involved with. In. 
So let's start with uh, what I've called broadly uh, digital process control. Um, that really uh, only became possible when we changed from uh, conventional transformer rectifier power sources with um, switch control to electronic power control by um, what was originally thyristors and transistors, but more recently and predominantly now primary rectifier inverters, which are the um, standard uh, intelligent power sources that we now use for gas metal arc welding, um, but also for the other gas shielded arc welding processes like um, gas tungsten arc welding, which you probably call TIG, um, and uh, plasma welding. The reason for using the advantages of using those um, advanced power sources was they enabled the process characteristics to be controlled in real time, the transient characteristics of the, uh, the output. Uh, and that's enabled us to invent or develop new modes of operation, particularly in gas metal art welding. Um, and those developments are now referred to as um, waveform control processes. And although we've, uh, we've um, discussed various different names for the processes, I think in the uh, International Institute, we've settled on waveform controlled welding to describe uh, those processes. And the definition of that is now embodied in an international standard. Um, which is listed there and the description uh, of waveform control is, uh, is shown at the top of that slide. And really, um, in the gas metal art welding, what we're really talking about is controlling the metal transfer from the, uh, the electrode, the consumable electrode, into the well pool. And if we go to the sort of uh, conventional types of metal transfer, the first three columns in this, uh, this table show you the normal um, conventional modes of transfer that are um, developed by simply controlling the, uh, the average current and average wire feed speed. Um, on the right of that table, the final column, we talk about the subdivisions of those conventional modes, which are uh, control short circuit, pulse drop transfer, pulse spray and modified spray. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those um, in the following slide. So <clears throat> these are the conventional modes of transfer. Um, on the left is um, the globular mode, and you can see it's dominated by uh, gravitational force, um, and droplets grow very large, and uh, there's a lot of spatter developed. Um, so it's not a very useful operating mode for, for most uh, applications. On the right, you can see, and I'm hoping these videos are uh, displaying okay. Um, please let me know if they're not. Um, yeah, 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 we can see, we can see. Okay. Uh, I'm just a bit concerned about the, the uh, transmission from uh, Australia to India. <laughs> oh, well, you, now it's working fine, yeah. It's good. <laughs> Um, so you, on the, the right, you, you can see the um, high-speed image of um, spray transfer, which is 
a lot quieter mode, a lot more controlled, uh, and it provides a useful mode of operation for relatively high current welding. And usually spray transfer like that only occurs above a threshold current of around about 200 amps, depending on the, the wide diameter and operating characteristics. Um, that means that the heat input is relatively high, deposition rates are high, and the process is uh, useful for high deposition welding, but is difficult to use out of position or, uh, or to reduce the heat input at lower currents. There is a way of improving on that, and that's called pulse transfer. And this is probably one of the first waveform controlled uh, technologies that was used. And you can see at the top there, uh, a schematic of the type of current waveform that's used, uh, which is an idealized um, rectangular waveform to it. And that's applied um, to detach a droplet of uh, material from the end of the wire uh, by increasing the, uh, the Lorentz force, the magnetic uh, pinch force. And it allows you to extend the operation of spray transfer into a, a mode that um, operates at much lower current, lower heat input, and is very well controlled. So you can see from the video that every pulse that's applied detaches one droplet. And that means that you can write very clear rules for the operation of the process. And I've just illustrated one of them there, which is the, uh, the relationship between the pulse current and the pulse time, um, and which can be uh, determined very accurately, and we we between the the two red lines on the graph, we know that we'll always get that one drop per pulse detachment, and that means that we can relate that to the wire feed speed, and we can introduce things like that we call synergic control, but it's basically um, a simplified control of the process using. Uh, uh, linked uh, wire feed speed and pulse um, frequency. If we look at the alternative conventional type of transfer, um, which would normally be used to operate at lower currents, we can see that the, um, the waveform of that type of transfer is uh, not quite as regular. That's uh, the current waveform in red at the top and the voltage waveform down at the bottom. Um, and we're getting a series of short circuits which are um, generated by that high current peak, which does tend to cause explosive rupture of the short circuit, and that causes instability and spatter. Um, and up until um, a few years ago, it was thought that that was uh, too difficult to, to control uh, using those transient waveform control techniques because there's a natural inherent um, statistical variation in the process. In fact, uh, it was the Welding Institute in the UK um, quite a while ago developed a technique using a transistor series regulator power source to modify the current waveform in short circuit transfer. And in this case, they used, I'll try and get uh, a pointer. Yeah. They used um, a waveform that looked a bit like this. So the, um, the current was reduced 
immediately before the short circuit and in fact that tends to force the short circuit to occur but it allows the the short circuit to wet into the well pool and form a, a solid grid and then the current is raised but before the rupture occurs at high current the current is reduced um, all of this is possible with um, uh, high speed electronic power control in order to detect when the short circuit is about to rupture uh, and reduce the current what uh, Bowton did at TWI was to look at the voltage and when the voltage exceeded a certain threshold he turned off the current which is it worked perfectly um, for an automotive application but unfortunately the threshold voltage tends to vary um, if you uh, move the, the welding torch for example which means that the prediction of the short circuit end is unpredictable. Um, thank you. Right. So um, for a while that was uh, a bit of a problem. We had a process that worked very well, but um, uh, was limited in its uh, practical ability and then Lincoln Electric in the States developed a technique for detecting the end of the short circuit by using the change in the rate of slope of the, um, the voltage during the, the short circuit and that was much less uh, much more reliable uh, in predicting the end of the short circuit and they could then turn off the current very reliably. Um, and this became known as STT, it was probably one of the first uh, control, waveform control short circuit processes, um, and was, was used very uh, across the, the board for um, lower current operations, thinner materials. But it also um, gave very good root penetration control. Uh, uh, we actually um, developed, and this is an example of uh, industry uh, pool, if you like. Uh, we developed the use of that uh, process for welding of. Uh, pipelines um, and it worked particularly well for route runs in, in pipe but the problem was that it was much slower than the um, the alternative processes that the pipeline industry was used to this is um, usually manual metal arc welding with cellulosic electrodes so we looked at ways of trying to improve the uh, the speed of operation and we were able to do that by using the um, the wire feed rate or by changing the wire feed rate as well as the voltage and the current and in fact what we did was uh, reverse the wire feeding rate during the short circuit you can see from this uh, graph down the bottom here it's again it's a schematic of uh, how we reverse the wire feed rate when the short circuit occurred and then reinstated it at the end of the short circuit the result of that was we could produce um, welds in the, in the root run of a girth weld on a pipe at about three times the speed could do it with STT or conventional waveform control transfer. Um, the other thing that um, was remarkable about that is that we could use 
100% CO2 shielding with very smooth transfer and very little spatter. Coincidentally, at the same time, um, we, uh, we were working in parallel with uh, a commercial company and we didn't really uh, know what, were, what was happening, but Fronius uh, developed an almost identical operating um, system for completely different reasons. And as the pictures on the left show, um, it used the same principle that wire was fed towards the, the plate during the uh, arcing period. When the short circuit occurred, the wire was retracted very quickly. Um, and then uh, the arc was re-established. So <clears throat> seems that my video here, oh, it's working now, I think. Um, and you can see that that's, you can't even see the short circuits occurring there uh, because the, um, the high-speed video is a bit uh, too slow, but you could see how regular the process operates. And it's very um, tolerant to changes in arc length, um, as uh, as you could see in that uh, video. So all of those waveform control modes have given us better overall performance. Uh, they tend to require different control variables. Um, such as setting the uh, current peaks and the background levels, but using the, uh, the synergic control system, we can simplify the control so that uh, that's much less complicated. One uh, thing that's only recently been um, realized um, in the standards is that you can't actually use average current and average voltage and travel speed to calculate heat energy. Um, you really need to use transient uh, measurements of uh, voltage and current to get a, an accurate um, representation of heat input and uh, the, the ISO uh, standard sets out the way in which you can do that and we in the IIW we spent a lot of time uh, developing um, techniques to explain that and those uh, those are quite important factors because they affect the way in which you uh, operate the welding process uh, and control the welding process and I'll mention a bit more about that later there have been one or two other um, developments apart from the, or in addition to the waveform control, they actually use very similar background techniques. Um, but two of these are um, tandem gas metal art welding, which uses two wires in parallel, usually about 15 millimeters apart, independently supplied from two different um, power sources. Um, and if the video works, yes, um, so you can see that operating, um, and it gives you much higher travel speed. And this is actually, see, hopefully, see the video high speed video now. Um, and you can see that waveform control is used. Um, to control the two separate power sources actually in the pulse mode. There's one more recent development, which is shown at the bottom here. You can see that there are two wires. Um, and when I run the video, you won't, probably won't be able to see the two wires, but there are two wires through the same contact tip. Um, and this is called hyperfill. It's a, a very, High definition 
Come to this. And I apologise for the, uh, the audio. <laughs> I'm being sick with the audio. You can probably tell that it's a much higher deposition rate. It's something like twice the deposition rate of um, conventional transfer. So those, uh, in summary, are the um, the operating modes um, of the basic process that we've uh, we've used um, in the the following uh, applications, robotic uh, automation, uh, wire out arc additive manufacturing, and, and also in um, digital monitoring. And I'll go through each of those and try and illustrate them with some um, transfer of uh, the fundamental uh, research into industry applications. So if we look first at robotic automation, uh, and, and you are all probably fairly aware of the advantages of uh, robotic arc welding automation in, uh, in industry, particularly in um, arc welding processes, it offers us an improvement in uh, quality, uh, higher productivity, and also improved safety, um, which is becoming an even um, more important aspect, um, particularly if we start to use um, uh, alloy consumables like um, stainless steel, which can introduce uh, fume safety problems. On the debit side, uh, there are uh, um, costs involved in the, the setup of robotic programming, um, jigs uh, and uh, fixtures are one problem uh, which involve cost. Um, the argument that we not always used need high volume uh, production to justify robots is quite common. But one of the biggest pro problems uh, is the programming of the time involved in, uh, in programming the robot it tends to be a deterrent for many, for many applications. And that's because the, the conventional methods, the teach pendant methods, are time consuming uh, and that means they're also costly. And it varies but it, um, in uh, arc welding applications, typically you can spend 10 to 100 times more uh, time on actually programming a robot than welding. Um, the uh, avoiding uh, crashes um, is is quite difficult, uh, and planning the optimum path is uh, is challenging, and it's a skill that needs to be learned by conventional robot programmers. There are systems for offline programming, um, but these tend to be um, a bit difficult for uh, more complex fabrications and you still require some sort of skill in the uh, in the programmer and the conventional offline programming um, <clears throat> we uh, we spent a lot of time looking at um, commercial systems for offline programming it does offer the ability to transport programs from one robot to another quite easily, but it it only really removed the task of uh, of programming from a teach pendant, a manual teach pendant, to a computer, and it requires 
significant but different, different uh, operator skills to, to run the offline program. Again, crash avoidance and path optimization can be quite difficult. Uh, and it's also time consuming, believe it or not. Um, you're just sitting at a computer console instead of uh, at a, a robot pen. We were faced with a, a practical application and uh, we found that the conventional offline programming systems didn't work. Uh, so we developed a technique which we call automatic offline programming. Uh, which really takes the intelligence of the skilled operator and puts it in the computer that controls the robot. And that extends the operating capability of the robot to lower volume uh, applications. And I'll try and illustrate that with the real applications. But if we look at what's involved in that offline programming is shown in the previous slide as a black box. Uh, but in fact, it's a fairly complicated uh, set of uh, software, uh, which involves a lot of um, probability, um, uh, road mapping, um, a lot of uh, basic mathematical modeling. And in essence, it, uh, it takes a CAD model, which a normal offline programming uh, system would take. It generates what we call tags, uh, which are notifying the position in space of the robot. It allows the robot traject trajectory to be planned. It allows the process planning to occur. It then um, carries out post-processing to incorporate all that data into something that can be used for a robot program. You can optionally use simulation to see what's happening, but in fact, the, the system is so reliable that you don't really need simulation. Um, you carry out uh, a calibration step in order to make sure that the robot is uh, calibrated to the program. And you feed that to the robot programmer using the native robot programming language. Um, the, the details of this are, uh, are covered in some of the papers that we've published that are listed on that slide. In reality, uh, we were faced with a, a problem that um, the manufacturers of this uh, this vehicle, it's a 15 ton uh, armoured personnel carrier, uh, which is made in Australia. Um, and that particular vehicle is an all welded uh, hull. Um, and they were moving from manual operation to robot operation, they actually made the decision to do that because the manual operation was uh, a little uh, slow and also um, had various safety hazards in them. What I'll show you is the, the actual full welding operation and you, you'll see what the problem is. Um, in order to access <clears throat> the hull, it was mounted on a positioner, a rotator, uh, but the robots, uh, in order to get into the, the hull, uh, there's a robot sitting on a robot on a linear track. So each of those robot systems has 13 degrees of freedom. So you can imagine programming that manually. 
is quite difficult. And in fact, this is the simulation of the, um, the automatic offline programming system. Um, originally, the robots were programmed by the system integrator and the integrator took nine months to actually program that application. Um, and in fact, even when it was programmed, it only completed about 30% of the world. The automated offline programming system took a long time to develop, but in, in actual fact, uh, commissioning it on the shop floor took about a month. Um, and it completed the, the robot system was able to complete something like 90% uh, of the wells um, and has been used in production ever since. Um, but in that case, it was uh, purely um, sensing from uh, or, or using the CAD program as the input to the program. But that's not always uh, possible. In some cases, uh, the workpiece may move, uh, distortion may occur, and the situation changes. So the program um, is not capable of uh, following its instructions. And in that case, we need to introduce some form of sensors, correct uh, variations. And here we use, uh, in this case, it's a, a laser line center, so sensor. So you can see on the left, we've got a complex tubular joint. Uh, and the laser sensor is used to locate the joint so that the weld seam can be accurately completed. We also uh, have used 3D scanning um, in situations where there's no particular CAD information or the CAD information is not particularly good. Uh, and this is in our laboratory, the, uh, the use of um, a, a commercial um, scanner to generate a point cloud of the uh, fabrication and then to use that to program the robot using the automatic offline programming system to generate a path uh, for the weld. Um, that can be adapted to situations like uh, repair where the, uh, the actual um, uh, wear pattern may vary from component to component. And again, we use the 3D scanner to generate the equivalent of uh, a CAD drawing. So we generate a point cloud uh, and then convert that into a, a CAD drawing. In fact, it also includes the cell, the operating cell, uh, so we can then use, um, in fact, in this case, we use virtual reality uh, scanning to locate or to tell the system where the wear areas are so that the robot can be programmed to repair those areas. Uh, I'll probably talk a little bit more when we talk about additive manufacture about how that's used in practice, but uh, before we leave robots, uh, I could um, mention this particular um, robotics, which is growing, and I, I apologize, apologize in advance for the sound, but um, this is the use of collaborating robots um, or cobots. And you remember I, I mentioned the, uh, the programming problem with conventional robots. The simple 
applications and particularly smaller applications. There's great interest now in the use of turbines. And we're actually using them um, to demonstrate, demonstrate the capabilities for simple applications. Uh, I apologize for <laughs> the music in that um, uh, that video, um, but I think it illustrated the um, the alternative to conventional robots to simplify the, uh, the programming task. That isn't really applicable to very large applications or more complex applications. If we uh, move on from robotic automation to really a, an application of a uh, combined application of gas metal art welding uh, and robotic automation, which is uh, wire arc additive manufacturing. It, the wire arc additive manufacturing system is, uh, is shown in this uh, diagram here. Um, which is probably familiar to you, but it starts like the uh, robot programming with a CAD program, slicing, path generation, uh, process control, process monitoring, bead modeling, modeling uh, to generate the bead size, path placement. So these are all very similar to the robot programming steps. Uh, to program control. If um, it's probably easier to illustrate by um, an actual um, model of a, a simple example here. This is one of the first examples that we tried. And you could see in the background there the software as it was developed. And then finally, the uh, the actual component that was developed from that um, CAD model. That was uh, really a test piece. This was a real application uh, for a company um, that makes pumps. It was a nickel aluminium bronze component for a pump. Um, as you can see, it's using, it's actually using um, uh, waveform control short circuit transfer to, to develop that component, which is then machined uh, to produce this uh, final component. One final thing I'll show you here is, uh, and again, I think I have to apologize for the music. It's a bit less uh, confronting this particular music. This is um, a very recent application which we carried out for the Inter International Institute of Welding um, to illustrate the, uh, the use of wire arc additive manufacturing in uh, artwork. Um, The only uh, the reason I'm showing you this, apart from the fact that it's uh, an interesting application, is that uh, it actually details the stages in the programming of that complex application, and it illustrates the use of uh, additional sensors like temperature sensors uh, to control the temperature of the the workpiece. Um, which is quite important for um, maintaining the uh, shape of the workpiece. 
and the uh, the metallurgical quality. So the cooling is uh, is forced by using um, an air jet nozzle in this case, which is another development that's uh, quite important in uh, fire arc additive manufacturing. Well, this is a, a speeded up uh, version of the uh, application. Now, I'll, I'll move on because of time, but um, the the final uh, item was actually exhibited at the. International Institute of Welding and the Assembly. Uh, yeah. The final area that I want to just cover is uh, digital data monitoring. And you'll be familiar with uh, the development of Industry 4.0, uh, which is uh, uh, the overall industry based move to. Um, to cyber, what we call cyber physical systems. But in welding, what that means is uh, a move towards, um, on the right here, intercontent, interconnectivity of, um, of equipment and uh, data, transparency of data, um, the use of data and uh, big data, the technical assistance in diagnostics and the use of that data for decision support. Why is it important in welding? Well, welding is recognized um, as a special process, not for any particular grand reason, but because it's difficult to actually um, inspect the quality of a weld after it's made, uh, you can actually tell whether there are defects in a weld, but you can't tell whether the metallurgical quality of the weld is uh, is what you expect and whether the strength of the weld is what you expect. And if you don't get it right, uh, the results can be disastrous. And on the right there is one disastrous result of a ship falling in half. Uh, uh, American ship. Uh, it's a famous failure of a ship from a from a weld uh, in a in a deck housing that uh, fractured through the hull, uh, and it wasn't an isolated example. And in practice, what's uh, carried out in order to control that is a thing called weld procedure management, which is a fairly complex manual procedure for looking at the uh, the weld and determining what the optimum procedures are, and then to test those and qualify them, uh, and to use those variables that you've determined as being adequate uh, in practice, and to make sure that you monitor. Um, to ensure that you're meeting the requirements. The question is how you do that monitoring. In the past, it's been by a man looking at a, um, a measuring device, uh, an ammeter, voltmeter, speed measuring device, uh, but that can be quite unreliable. We're now at the stage where we've got uh, tools like this. This is a standalone um, uh, well data logger. It's my own uh, toy that I use. Um, it uh, allows online data monitoring uh, 
and data recording. It also increasingly it's included in uh, the equipment so that the uh, the output of the equipment can be used directly for computer data logging. It can be used in a network situation so that you can take the output of this logger uh, and network it either uh, through a wired network or in this case uh, through a cloud system and a wireless system to a remote um, device. Um, that happens to be my phone that uh, is picking up the output from this particular device. The important thing is that not only does it capture that data, it allows you to analyze that data um, remotely uh, and detect whether there's anything going wrong with the process. It can enable you to determine what the productivity of the process is and whether there are any uh, alarms when the process deviates from what we expect. So it gives us uh, an improvement in productivity, uh, out of tolerance alarms, statistical process control capabilities, and online defect alerts, uh, which is a major advantage of control. So, in summary, uh, most of the, the developments uh, that I've talked about have been underpinned by those uh, basic developments in gas metal art welding um, and moving them into uh, welding equipment and robotics and process monitoring. As a result of that we've been able to tackle industry applications and improve productivity uh, and exploit the, the benefits of uh, industry 4.0. I'm aware that what I've done is covered a lot of areas fairly quickly, and I haven't gone into the basic. Uh, but, uh, you can find that we've uh, we've probably got a couple of hundred publications covering those areas and there's a couple of them cited here but you can find many of them just by uh, using Google Scholar on our, our name. So with that I'd like to thank you for um, your yeah. attention. Um, hopefully uh, everything worked reasonably well and um, I'm just trying to <laughs> yeah, you can you can uh, proceed. You can come out of your presentation and you can switch on your video. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, do that. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, my uh, I'm not sure whether I'm starting the video again. Hopefully, uh, yeah. yeah, we can see you now. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent, Professor Norris. I mean, uh, it was a wonderful talk taking us to to, to the journey of uh, the the advancement in the field of gas metal in uh, art welding, starting from the digital process control to robotic automation, warm process, and finally the industry for the application. I understand, you know, it's already 9.30, so we'll not bother you uh, with too many questions. Just one question from my side, and then I'll I'll read one or two questions from the, uh, you know, the cat box, and, no. and then finish it off. You know, the, you have, uh, you know, the uh, rightly mentioned the importance of the industry 4.0 applications in the field of welding. And uh, uh, so, uh, can you please give us some idea, like, uh, uh, we talk about the monitoring, but when you talk about the feedback, real time, you know, the control of the process, if something goes wrong, some alarm comes up, 
then how uh, you know the how much what is the compatibility of the control systems to take the feedback recommendations i mean is it is it uh, you know the control uh, controllers are open uh, architecture can it take the feedback control easily yes i think it it operates at various different levels um the um the welding processes themselves, the digital control of the welding processes, allows feedback control. Um, in fact, it's inherent in uh, in the waveform control processes, uh, as you saw, um, detection of uh, short circuit current, for example, is inherent in the control of the process. Um, you can also use the um, uh, the overall data monitoring to detect variations in uh, in the process operation. So, in a simple example, you, you can use uh, classic statistical process control to see whether the, the process is deviating away from the chosen welding parameters and correcting that um, either um if it's a um a, a fairly gradual change you can correct it by changing the process operating parameters like travel speed and uh and current welding current um if it's a drastic change developing uh, serious defects then you can stop the process but in general uh with robotic uh applications and in wire arc additive manufacturing you can use um, those sensors to feedback control and i think you saw that a little bit in the case of that um, sculpture um, but that's a technique we use fairly commonly to measure temperature and to delay the onset of the next um, deposit until the weld is uh, cooled to a, uh, a level that we require. So, yes, those um, high speed uh, response systems uh, can be used uh, using monitoring to get to gain feedback control. Yeah, since it's uh, yeah already quite late uh, at your place, it's uh, three o'clock in the morning. I just ask two questions from the chat box, and then uh, you know, then we close this. No, uh, so no. What is the yeah? What is the typical cycle time? Uh, you know, the arcing, drop rate generation, short circuiting, uh, in case of uh, the gas metal arc welding. That's one of the questions placed in the chat box. Uh, cycle time. I'm not sure what the. Uh, uh, what cycle time we're talking about for gas metal art welding. Um, um, I mean, the, the sort of process cycle times we were talking about the, um, uh, the videos and the waveforms I was showing, we're, um, we're assessing it, uh, something like five kilohertz um, is the sampling time that we used. So the uh, the actual cycle time of the the process um, is uh, of the order of, for example, in short circuit welding and pulse welding, um, two to ten milliseconds. Um, uh, I, I hope that answers the question. It might yeah, be yeah. more about yeah. robotic cycle time, which is uh a little bit different yeah so just one more question uh, Professor Harris. Yeah. so when you talk about the warm process you know since the layer by layer deposition takes place so, so the there will be the heat concentration so the question is that uh you know the uh since the warping take place so uh, how to take care of the uh, the path planning when because of the you know warping happening because of uh, you know the metal one layer of metal gets deposited over the other one yeah well, that's, uh, I mentioned the adaptive control. Um, we, we actually use, um, a, and you saw the, the temperature um, sensing, but we also use um, usually fairly simple uh, laser, laser line sensors to uh, 
to measure position and uh, and we be profile uh, during welding uh, and to correct for that during the process and also we use things like um, forced cooling to try and limit the amount of distortion and uh, and residual stress although that's uh, usually quite a challenge you need to consider that when you're planning the uh, the application thank you so much so uh, thank you uh, professor noris uh, for taking out time uh, you know i understand it's very tough uh, to deliver a lecture you know in the in the early morning you know starting <laughs> from two o'clock to three o'clock i i thank you so much uh, you know for your presence and uh, you know, we will look forward to what uh, you know the uh, with you. I'll, I'll disturb you rather in in coming days, uh, so that we can work together. Yeah, that would yeah. be very welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, yeah. I I now request Ananta to let us know the the speakers for the next uh, the few weeks. Yeah. One uh, one more announcement is that the Center of Excellence has come up with a. Uh, training program for six days training program on industrial rewards in the month of January. So on uh, the next week, uh, Professor Grish Choudhury from uh, University of Illinois Urbana Sampan. Uh, Professor Choudhury will be talking about the robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, they followed by that on November 27th, we do have the George Vanderwood uh, on the metallographic practices in the field of welding. All webinars are getting recorded, and uh, so uh, you can, uh, you know, the, scan this capture and then get, you know, the, the QR code and get to see the the webinars. With this, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your presence, and we'll look forward to your presence in the coming, uh, you know, the Saturdays. Thank you so much. <laughs>